Hello and welcome to a new Italian PNC video on the map of Nos Confundum. Once again, we are back on the map of Nos Confundum. It's been a while since I've done a video on this, I had to take a break for like personal life reasons, but we're finally yet back again. We have discovered so many informations through this map and I'm not going to stop until we're finished with it. Even if, as we already know, it's hard to finish when there's still an unknown zone outside of the known universe. That said, let's get right back into it. So with this red uh, line, I delimitate the places we already talked about in previous videos and the places we have still to talk about. As you can see, we have barely scratched half of the map, so we have still a lot of information to talk about. Featuring already, we have talked about Earth, we have talked about all the uh, rings outside of Earth, so the first and second rings, then we've talked about the Anunnaki lands, the Sea of Horus, the lands of the Custodians, the lands of Quayoar, the lands of Tyr, the lands of Baldur, lands of Kronos, lands of the second Earth, lands of Clones, Titanides, Titania, lands of Uranus, Leonis, lands of Neptune, and so on and so forth. I can't repeat all of these. But you already know what the common things are to be expected. There is a connection with ancient knowledge of ancient humans which were well connected to the origins of Earth and that well uh, established themselves as well connected even to the uh, primordial origins of the universe, so they knew more than we know now. Then there is a connection with mythology, a lot of mythological things that we believe that never happened or that we believe were only happening in people's heads in the past did happen but did happen in the scope of the entire universe, or at least this is what what the Nos Confundent map shows through all these uh, planes of existence that are separately existing in the entire universe. Then again, one other important thing, the universe is not created by space and uh, void matter alone, but it is created by different uh, terrains basically. We have seas of oceans, so actual water, but then again we have seas of ozone which are only traversable through like air, because of course ozone is not water. Then we have seas of ice, walls of ice, walls of land, walls of wastes, and so on and so forth, even deserts as we can see in the Anunnaki lands and the lands of Seth. So the reality of the universe in uh, the Nos Confundent map is of course very different from that of we know of. Uh, but then again, we already know about this in the previous episodes, I wanted just to remind you all what we are talking about because this episode will be filled with information that has to do with mythology and uh, the ancient knowledges. So first of all, we're going to go north. As you can see in this map, we have basically did uh, done a round, round around of the map. We started here on Earth, we went like on Mars and the near places, then we started going south, then we again went once again here, and then we basically went all the way here. So now that we're done, we're going back north and exploring the celestial lands of Terra Incognita and the places north of it. So let's just get right into it and start with the celestial lands of Terra Incognita. So celestial lands of Terra Incognita is one of the weirdest places in the entire known universe. You know why? Because the celestial lands are one of the only places that is depicted on this map but that remains Terra Incognita. So for those of, no of you that do not know what Terra incognita means, terra incognita means literally in Latin, uh, it means a terra or land that we do not know anything about, so it's completely completely unknown what it is about. We can only see things that we can observe through our own lenses with an astrographer or something like this, but we, you can't really know anything else. So we know about the celestial lands that they exist in part of a nebulosa, so a multiple of different stars, so we know that their size has to be pretty large because otherwise they couldn't exist in such a big space, but they are divided by the rest of the universe, not by oceans of ozone, not by deserts, not by walls, but by frigid wastelands which are completely untraversable. This means that there is no way to actually get into the celestial lands and to actually discover the terra incognita. This is why there is nothing to do here and there is basically no way to actually get here. As you can see the only connections that actually bring terra incognita to the other places are from this part here that we are not going to dwell in today and from all these places here. As you can see there are some little portals, little places here that you can go through and the other um, 
planes of existence like Lacerda's lands and here in the lands of Venus which we already talked about. But this once more is through the frigid wastes and the frigid wastes which can be understood by this kind of texture here are completely untraversable because it's like trying to traverse solid matter all throughout. So imagine to trying to traverse a box. Unless you can get to a wormhole which comes into this place, you can do it. But the exception is, instead of like many other planes of existence, these are completely void of wormholes. So there is no wormhole that can create from somewhere else in the universe and bring you to the celestial lands, which already cuts off a big part of the transportation methods that we already thought of. Then we have of course the like... Um, like the creations of energy that we saw with the cores, the nucleus, and we had a nucleus right here, nucleus 28-0, that we'll talk about later. But the weird thing is, despite it being in the same kind of peripheral region of the galaxy or the universe, it is not connected, as you can see, to the actual celestial lens. So it's completely impossible to actually get to the celestial lens through a wormhole created by nucleus 28-0, which means that the celestial lens are bound to remain terra incognita forever until we discover a third or fourth method of transportation that does not involve ships, does not involve any jet-powered or fuel-powered transportation device, and that does not uh, involve anything more relative like uh, wormholes. So this means it's basically impossible to traverse right off now. Um, but the important thing to remember is that we do not have to care about the Celestial Lands that much because of course there are so many other places to explore in the universe that the Celestial Lands are comparatively not that important. This is why I want to uh, put your attention on the next place which is insane. This is Brahma. As you can see once again it is kind of bordering this um, frigid wasteland so it might be difficult to traverse but it is possible because the um, northern and northern westernmost part of Brahma is in fact connected to the rest of the known universe through what appears to be a notion of ozone. So once again traversable through jets, um, not like jets like the plane, jets like um, fuel, you know what I mean? Like planes, things like that. So traversable through high speed velocities and of course wormholes, once again, easier method if you can actually achieve one through a nucleus. But then again, Brahma itself is an amazing and wondrous plane of existence I want to dwell about very, very longly. Because this Brahma is the first plane of existence in the entirety of the Noscon Fundin map that has to do with the Indian and Hindu mythology and religion, actually, because it's still va vastly practiced in India. So it's even more connected to what we already know. So this is this is why it's so important. Most of these places have to do with ancient mythology that has been lost to time. Things like Neptune, the Anunnaki, the like uh, Eridania and Elysium of Mars, uh, the places of Tyr, Baldur, Adu, Heimdall, uh, Thel, Kronos. All these places have had to do with ancient mythology. So knowledge that we did have in ancient times in like 2000, 3000 BC, but that went lost to time. And eventually we rediscovered it through modern day lenses and we uh, just thought it was mythology, thought it was fake, thought it was nothing of to be important, just, just some stories of the ancients. But Brahma is about Hinduism. And Hinduism is a well-practiced religion with still thousands, actually no billions, of practicing individuals. So it's way more connected to what we thought about. So if there's some Hindu watchers of mine, let me know if what I'm going to say now actually makes sense and if it does connect with the Brahma we already know of. So Brahma as a plane of existence is uh, characterized by the fact that it is very uh, middle-sized, like it's not especially large or especially uh, small as a plane of existence. As you can see, it's uh, roughly the size of the internal uh, rings of Earth, so it's not even as large as the third or as the second ring. It's it's mostly, mostly the uh, known lands of Earth and the uh, first ring. But then again, it is mostly important because of its origin. So let's start with what actually is Brahma. So Brahma is a Hindu god of creation and of the material universe. So everything that is physical, everything that you can touch, see and hear and uh, whatever the other six senses say, all right? Fifth, five senses? I can't remember if there's five or six senses. But the important thing is that Brahma has to do with the physical universe. And you would be asking yourself, well, why is that important? Well, because Brahma itself as a divine entity is still known. Like it, it is well, well recorded and we know what we, he looks like and we know what he does and we know all about him and he has four faces. 
with each reciting a Veda, which is a secret book in Hinduism. Vedas are the equivalent of the Bible or the Torah in Hinduism, so you can see what this connects to um, what we know as of now. Uh, Brahma itself, as a plane of existence, has direct connection to the Brahma, the god, or like the divine entity of Hinduism. Because with Vishnu and Shiva the Destroyer, Brahma forms the Tri Murti, the final being of birth, life and death. So in one way or another, Brahma, the plane of existence, is one of the major catalysts for the creation of any single plane of existence near it. So while we know that nucleuses as a plane of existence elements and give power to and kind of just feed the planes of existence that are near them and create energy for them that then they use to sustain life. But Brahma be, uh, like creates this in a whole new way because it gets the energy from the nucleus 280 but then it recycles itself through Brahma the god that inhabits this planet and then it creates and establishes life alongside all the known worlds of this area of the universe. So let me mostly explain what has to do with mythology. So Brahma creates the material world within the process of latency. So what latency is, is that basically uh, the universe gets created but it isn't material at first. This is called avyatka in Hinduism which is basically when the universe, while already being created, it has no physical matter and nothing that can be uh, accessed through the senses of a human being or of a, like, generally physical senses. You can only access it through your mind, so through, like, astral uh, projection, things like that, prayer, religion, and things like that. So it's in latency, it's in avyatka. And then it is followed, this process, it is followed by a new material truth, which is called the Sarga. And the Sarga is what Brahma practices, basically. So he goes from starting with the Avyatka, which starts with latency and not being material enough, and then through Brahma and through the nucleus 28-0 that elements it and uh, feeds it, it finally becomes truth material, materialized, basically. And the process this is formed through, through uh, Hindu mythology and religion, is the following. So Brahma uh, thus generates what is made by him by inserting his seed in the primordial fluid, usually the first waters of a plane of existence. So what this means is that Brahma creates... <laughs> okay, so his seed is probably a metaphor. I don't think it's actually his seed as in, you know what I mean, but it's probably like his essence, his life essence is given to the waters of the plane of existence as you know water is the starter of all life without water nobody would exist we are 70 percent water and all yada yada you already know that and through these waters he injects basically life so you know how in like when we when we learn about the first life on earth if you don't go by the biblical standard which is another kind of thing but even with the biblical standard we do now uh, acknowledge the importance of water with life you know the great flood and stuff like that so we know that water uh, plays a uh, important, extremely important factor in the creation of the human being and in creation in general of the life on a planet of existence and so on and so forth. And Brahma literally explains how this goes from literally just the molecules that form water to the actual life. So through this process, after a millennia, after more millennia, actually in the Vedas it's described as a century, but of course this is uh, to be intended through the metaphor of like a short creation, just as in the Bible we have seven days for the entire universe, in the Vedas we have 100 uh, years for the entirety of the Brahma's journey, but so let's say millennia, millennia later, what is made by him uh, inserting his seed in the primordial fluid, uh, Brahman seed mixed with the primordial soup gives rise to a planet full of life. So that is the process that Brahma partakes in when creating life. So Brahma itself as a plane of existence, now detached from the uh, figure of Indian mythology and Hindu religion, sees itself as the center of all the planes of existence near him. So while itself is not a nucleus, but it is feed by the nucleus 28-0, it gives power to the celestial lands, as much as we know, the Tierras de Shirsa, so Lazarus land, the entirety of this constellation, the entirety of all of this, which is why this part of the universe, except for the celestial lands, because we do not know anything about them, is one of the only parts of the universe where you can find multiple subsequent 
and continuous places and planes of existence that are in fact inhabited by one form of life and another or another. What we saw in the southern part of the map of Nos Confundum, there were many, many, many planes of existence that were in, uh, inhospitable to life, where nothing could live and nothing could exist unless through wormholes or this random transportations. We saw a lot of them in these parts and even some of these ones. Well, in this part, as you can see already just from the colors of the lands that are depicted on the map, they are lush, they are fertile, they are able to sustain life, and this indeed is thanks to Brahma, which by the way, being connected to this part of the oceans of ozone, and this connected to this part of the um, introversal uh, wasteland, of frigid wasteland, still makes it be the center of the known universe in this part, basically. So it does not feed places like Earth, but you can see why the Hindu religion uh, itself focuses on Brahma's aspect in uh, Earth, because of course, at some point in uh, the like history of the universe, Brahma, the divinity, probably was on Earth, so he actually uh, established parts of what we know Earth-like. So this is basically it when it comes to Brahma. It was a very like specific explanation. I hope you guys understood what I'm talking about. You have to scroll a bit into the knowledge of Hinduism as a religion and of Brahma. There's much I don't know, of course, not being a practicing uh, Hinduist, but Hinduist? Is that the phrase or is it Hindu? Anyway, I, um, if you know more than me, let me know in the comments. I'm very glad if someone informs me of something I do not know yet. But now let's get to the next place. So we just talked about uh, how all these places have life, blah, 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 blah. And then there's one exception that I already have to make immediately, and that is the Toxic Lands. The Toxic Lands is the next uh, landmass, basically, plane of existence we're going to look at. And the Toxic Lands just kind of suck, let's be honest. Toxic Lands started through the Brahman process and all of that as a plane of existence that could support life and that could create uh, inhabitants. As we can see, there are some original continents that were established as they are so even with some kind of green of course it is not the lively green that we can see on other planes of existence but originally they were continents with life on them whether it be vegetation whether it be fauna there were more and then they were living beings with intelligence and these living beings with intelligence what do you think they did did they leave the continents apart did they leave them established as they were and not like just try to play god with the nature that exists in them well no that's the exact opposite of what existed in fact the original toxic lands before they were even known as toxic lands were much akin to earth as in kind of the way they functioned as you can see it by the color of the oceans the oceans were of water they had a part of them that was of helium but it wasn't really like important to the actual planes of existence since they could traverse the entirety of their plane of existence with boats as we do with uh, earth and now that that is said they were engulfed by a frigid wasteland themselves so this is why after they messed with the uh, like natural resources and with the existence of their world they were cut off from the rest of the known universe which made them impossible to reach out for help or to colonize another part of the universe or to skip and to go somewhere else to just exist in another form where like I said, through the frigid wastelands and through all of what I already talked about, it's impossible to leave this part of the universe. And unfortunately, that means also no wormholes, so no any other kind of like immediate transportation, random transportations, which meant they were doomed to die of a horrible death. And this toxic sludge of orangish color that exists here is not continents, indeed it is not. It is literal oceans of toxic wastes, created by radiation, created by irradiated matter, created by all their toxic wastes that were produced by the civilization that inhabited what is now the toxic lands. And eventually, this kept on going, this kept on becoming worse and worse and worse, it kept on becoming more unlivable and more unlivable, and eventually, these continents were becoming completely unlivable, and that meant the extinction of the civilization that existed here. Which means that now, unless some parts of the vegetation might have remained somewhat livable in this plane of existence, everything else is dead. From the waters, to the sun, to everything else, the only things that remain are the continents burned up in this sludge of toxic wastes, and that's kind of it. And they have nowhere to go, and these continents, just like we saw with the Terra Incognita of uh, Celestial Lands, are going to remain, like I said, forever unless we discover another form of transportation to go through the um, frigid wastes, basically. 
But now let's get back to something more happy, I guess, because of course the story of the toxic lands is a great one of great despair, which of course we have to think about when we treat Earth in the way we are treating of it. Of course, with all the uh, polluting and we are doing as a species, it's not really good. The thing that differs us from them is, of course, we have chances to go outside of our land. We do not have any frigid wasteland that is uh, blocking us from going anywhere else. So if things really get that bad, we can, of course, exit what we know of as our own world and just go to somewhere else. But in the case of the ones that lived in the toxic lands, that was not the case, and of course, they died. And that's just it. Now, once again, I'm going to say, let's get to another topic. So I'm just going to go swiftly through Mech Buddha, this uh, continent here. I mean, it's two continents in a very small landmass. I don't even know it. I mean, I have to call it a plane of existence because it is a star and it has a firmament. So, of course, I have to call it a plane of existence. But but as you can see, the size of it doesn't really justify it being called a fair, like a plane of existence in itself. Uh, it's very small. It is connected with a void, basically, uh, through the rest of these um, these um, planes of existence, which we will talk about in shortly. But it is not really relevant to the discussion. It probably has life. I'm going to assume it has some kind of vegetation. It really is. There is no information on Mac Buddha anywhere, neither in the sources of Nos Confunden, neither in just the internet. You only get to the information of this being a star and a known universe, and it's not really informants because you know we are looking at the continents, not the actual star. So that's kind of it for Mac Buddha. But I'm going to assume it's one of those level places that are uh, made livable and healthy through Brahma and the Nucleus 280. Now let's get to the source of the pasta, some would say, and let's get to the Dioscuri. So the Dioscuri are these, Alheda, Castor and Pollux. These three planes of existence are some of the weirdest but well connected of the entire universe, despite them not being connected by waters, ice or ozone. As you can see by this black matter that divides them, which was similar to the one that divides here, but we don't have, I don't think we have ever, okay, we did have this through uh, this part of the universe, and it is kind of the same thing. It is kind of a void. You know, like, when you think of space as a void, well, that's basically it. It's, like, wrong in the most cases when it comes to this map, but in this specific case, it is, in fact, a void that you can only traverse through spatial technology that we already talked about, and, of course, once again, since we already know about it, wormholes say with me wormholes it's always gonna be wormholes as a chance to get there unless of course we have frigid wastes but then again the pollux castor and alhida uh, planes of existence are very interesting so first of all they are all inhabited by who by descendants of humans and ancient demigods mixed together so you're already probably talking about what the hell you're talking about how they're inhabited by humans they are literally on the other side of the known universe how can these places be inhabited by the descendants of humans well it's actually very simple you see alheda castor and pollux are all elements of greek mythology ancient greek mythology actually and not only that they're actually all uh, like mixed together in a same family in fact alheda was the mother of castor and pollux in greek mythology but let's get back on the actual planets of existence. We'll get to the mythology right after. So first of all, Pollux is the largest of these, and it's actually one of the largest uh, largest planes of existence in the known universe. And it is, of course, very lush and green, as you can see, fertile, of course, once again, thanks, of course, to the Brahma. And uh, it is actually made of multiple continents. There's three major continents and a couple isles here and here. Uh, these are, of course, inhabited. It has mostly remained kind of like a sim similar ge geography to the Garden of Eden, so very lush, very like full of vegetation, not very developed when it comes to industrial capacity. It remained with the same technological air levels that it existed in ancient Greece before the city-state age. So we have to imagine something like uh, people living with nature and not really focusing on agriculture or like uh, going to f fish or something like that. So it's that kind of technology, right? No, no big space traveling devices, no weird uh, things that can get you from one side to the other. There's only life as a simple human being or simple demigod as they are but as a simple demigod and human being in those places so they do know of each other of course as you can see by the color these are oceans of water which means very traversable through uh, boats and the extreme size of them makes it that there are so many resources in them and so many ways to easy <laughs> and so many ways to actually live 
easily in life, but there is no actual wars happening, happening ever. There has been some uh, conflict through the continents themselves, but it's never be uh, like a country against one another. It's always something that has to do with the individuals. And of course, the humans that live in them are very happy compared to like ourselves and many others in the known universe. But then again, uh, let's get to Castor. So we already talked about Pollux. Castor is one of the only, actually, it's the only one of the Dioscuri that actually has two stars. So two uh, reverdated bodies of light. These are actually because of the multiple rings that divide Castor and Castor is actually one of the planes of existence similar to what the Noscom from the map shows of our own uh, Earth. As you can see in the Earth we have the known lands, first ring, second ring. By the way, second ring, we're talking about a series about the second ring as made by the map of the Beyond the Ice Wall series. I recommend you check it out. It's very interesting, it has beautiful map geography, beautiful physical attributes and just looks wonderful and has so many informations, recommend it. Go watch it now or not you choose it's all about you now let's get back to it and so what is weird with castor so differently from pollux castor got the bad end of the stick why in a short while while explain the mythology of it but the important thing is that castor has a way smaller population and that it is divided by these rings that actually make it harder for the people to contact themselves the two um uh, basically the two suns the two stars make it harder for the people to live there's higher temperatures uh, and the night day cycle is non-existent because when one side of the um, like sun is active the other one is off and so on and so forth so there's always a sun there's no night different from Pollux which is basically what we have on earth and uh, there's also way more continents which makes the nations way more divided and they actually create countries just like on earth and they fight each other and they actually have achieved a level of technology that is higher than the one in Pollux but it's still not on par with the one of modern day earth so better than pollux but not much better than us but then again we get to uh, actually alheda alheda is the last or oh, alheda alheda Al 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 let's just call it leda as in uh, greek mythology so leda is the last of these um planes of existence and it actually is the less interesting one there's not much to say about Leda the inside of the um, planet is actually not really livable there is of course some of the demigods that were in Castor and Pollux but it's mostly just descendants of humans and they kind of just went ex extinct in time because of the low levels of resources that can be found on Alheda of course the place is uh, covered through what is basically their version of Antarctica so they have this kind of uh, ice wall or ice like uh, I would call it that a semi crescent so kind of just a, a crescent just a crescent of ice that kind of ruins the way that the meteorological and geographical factors are uh, like govern on Alheda which means that the like planes of existence are not really livable and the only people that live now are the descendants of the Dioscuri now talking about the people not the actual like planes of existence we'll we'll get into it when i start about the mythology but then again alheda not very interesting not that crazy not really the place to be that's what i mean uh, also has countries also has religions but the religions are basically the same as the ancient greeks so kind of the greek pantheon and so on and so forth and the humans that exist them once again demigods are mostly at the same technological level as Pollux since there were no ways to actually develop themselves in such a hostile environment. So now let's actually get to the mythology of Castor, Pollux and Alhida and let's get right into what is actually going on with these places. So first of all let's start talking about the um, like actual characters Castor, Pollux and Alhida. As I said Alhida or Alhera is the mother of Castor and Pollux. So you'll be asking, what do you mean the mother? And why are they demigods? You've been keeping this up for a while. Why are they demigods? Well, it's easier said than done. It's actually Zeus's fault. So you know Zeus? Zeus, the god of thunder, the god of gods in ancient Greek mythology. Well, he kind of started this all because Alheda, the person, so the woman, was, let's just say, I, I want to make this, and I'm not joking, this is actually what happened. I want to make this more... PC, political correct, is that the word? I want to make this not controversial. What happened is that... Ah, uh, this is awful. Okay, so Zeus transformed himself into a swan. And then he went to Alheda, which was a woman. And then... They did things with each other. As a man, as a woman, but he 
was a swan. So yeah. And she got pregnant with Zeus, this child. And of course that can be good for anybody, right? So that's where the story of Castor and Pollux starts. Of course, Alheda wasn't really treated well by her husband or whatever kind of fiancé she had at the time when it was out that Castor and Pollux were Zeus's child and she kind of refused the fact that she ever slept with another man, which was even a worse situation because she knew she'd never slept with another man and it was true, but you know, you can't really convince that when you have children in your belly, you know what I mean? So what happened is that, I, I don't remember exactly what happened to Alheda, but it was something awful. So let's get to the, like, the um, first meal, right? The main course, Castor and Pollux themselves. So who are Castor and Pollux? Okay, we know we are the sons of a god and a human being, and what else? Well, their history has to do with Greek mythology, uh, specifically the, the myth of Castor and Pollux as the uh, part of the Argonauts. So you know how the ancients used kind of the stars to guide themselves at night when they had to uh, just be sailors and went through the, with boats in a direction or the other. They only had the wind and the stars to actually guide themselves in. So this is kind of where the story of Castor and Pollux as parts of the Argonauts started. For those that do not know about the Argonauts, I'm just going to make it very fast because I don't want to like 12 40 minutes on the Argonauts we already did with, with Brahma so basically the Argonauts were this massive expedition that was started by the ancient Greeks to recover the golden fleece which was a sign of divine power in ancient Greece and this golden fleece was not in Greece it actually was in uh, the places that is modern day Georgia kind of and which was called Colchis and these uh, groups of Greeks kind of just went together and tried to get this golden fleece back that was guarded by a king, a dragon and many men and blah blah blah. The thing is they needed a good navigator, they needed a good sailor that could guide them from Greece to Colchis and the only persons that were able to do this were Castor and Pollux, the ones ahead of the ship. So these two fellows just were the main navigators. So the ancient Greeks prayed to Castor Castor and Pollux after the old story ended, which we'll get to in a while, and uh, they actually prayed for them to actually get directions. So this is why so many people actually live in the lands of Castor and Pollux, it's just not the people that died, uh, it's not just the descendants of Castor and Pollux themselves after what happened with them, you know, I'll talk about it in a short while, you'll get what I mean. But it's also the people that prayed to them and died while they were at sailing. It's kind of a, like a punishment for not praying to some main gods of ancient Greek mythology at the time. There was no other god to pray of and you actually pray to Castor and Pollux instead of like uh, Neptune or something like uh, Zeus. So instead of ending where you should go to like Elysium, Eridania or just the Tartarus, you end in the planes of existence of Pollux and Castor, which actually aren't that bad. So, you know, you kind of got the good end of the stick. I don't know, the long one, I guess. So now let's actually get to what happened to Castor and Pollux, which made them be a part of these planes of existence and why these planes of existence themselves exist in these areas and are dedicated to Castor and Pollux. So what happened is basically that uh, they kind of almost died in a wedding scandal. Yeah, this sounds insane, but at that point in time, weddings were much bigger, de bigger deal than it is now. So basically what happened is that uh, there were two ancient Greek sisters, which were daughters of Leuchipos, and Leuchipos, or Leuchipos, was like kind of an important person, and he was very like rich, so he wanted a big compensation to marry out uh, his daughters. And here come Castor and Pollux, which are brothers, which are like uh, veterans of the Argonauts, which are veterans of the conquest of Attica uh, to liberate Elhana and many more adventures they went to and they come here and go okay we'll give you anything you want in terms of money just give us these two beautiful daughters of yours and so the guy just guess like okay sure i'll give you the daughters just give me the money so Leukippus is bribed into this and the problem is the daughters already have fiances and these fiances which were called idas and Lynchus, didn't just take this lightly they just kind of hated castor and pollux for what they did and the fact that they kind of just got their women so of course this had to go and become a whole deal, a whole problem, and what happened was that uh, Castor and Pollux went into a fight with Idas and Linceus, and while it seemed originally that Castor and Pollux were winning, eventually Linceus actually managed to kill Castor. So, crazy, you know? The two brothers, the two demigods, sons of Zeus and Halera, now one of them is killed by a random mortal that just wanted this woman. 
Of course, Pollux can't really process this at the moment, so the only way to process is to get revenge. So he goes and kills both Idas and Linceus, and Boris, his brother. But then, of course, they are demigods, so you can't really just end the story rare, right? So they go, actually not they, just Pollux, because the other one is dead. Pollux goes to an altar in ancient Greek temple of Zeus, and he goes, please, Zeus, my father, please help me and make me a god along Castor so we can live eternally. And eventually Zeus accepts. So he creates a way for them to exist outside of the Greek pantheon, so they are not prayed to, but inside of their own planes of existence, which in this case are Castor and Pollux, the landmasses, as we can see right now. Of course, this is all connected through the Brahma thing we learned about earlier, so without Brahma and the Nucleus 28-0, this would have never been conceived of, but through them and through this whole deal, this is actually what happened, and this is actually what came of the two of Pollux and Castor and Alida, and so on and so forth. So basically, this is the story of Calux, of sorry, of Pollux, Castor, and Alheda, and the entirety of this part of the known universe. So let's just get a line, a red line, to delimit it all the places we learned about today. I kind of also wanted to do Lacerda's lands, but I don't really know anything about them. I'm trying to still find information on them. If you know something that I don't know, let me know in the description down below. Uh, actually, not in the description, sorry, in the comments down below. I'm the guy that writes on the description. It's whatever. So let's just get this line here and let's continue the entire process of delimiting what we already talked about. Also, there is this little thing here that's kind of creepy. The Domlands. I have no idea what the Domlands are. I have no idea. So let's get right into Alheda, Castor and Pollux. Once again, all this part of the constellations are called the Oscuri, which is the collective name for Pollux and Castor, and of course their mother Alheda, or Leda. So let's get this thing hole here, let's get it right here, and then we have to avoid Lacerta's land. But with this kind of yearly shaped protuberance, we actually get our long time into getting more information about the known universe and to analyzing mythologically speaking and physically speaking the existence of this parts of the universe. So once again, we are finishing up on, the, on this episode of the uh, Nos Confundent map. There's still much more to know. I don't know if we're going to go west or east in the next episode. So maybe we go into this area or maybe we go into this area and maybe finish this area. Maybe not. It's a lot of information I have to search for, but I don't know. Let's see each other in the next episode and leave a comment in the disc in the comment section so you can help this channel grow and boost with the algorithm uh, subscribe to the channel if you like the video like and you know do the whole thing and yeah that's kind of it you will find uh, the discord server link in the description down below and thank you for watching we will see each other in the next episode goodbye